I wrote eight different introductions for this video. Let me know in the comments if I chose the right one. <laughs> the first time that I found myself mesmerized by Japanese action star Tak Sakaguchi's on-camera capabilities, he had a broken neck. It was 2011, and I was watching his co-directorial debut, Yakuza Weapon. It's a generally solid flick with one standout sequence, a four and a half minute single take action scene that moves through a building as he takes down a whole bunch of baddies. Unlike so many of the oneers we see in movies, including the subject of my last review, Train to Busan Presents Peninsula, it is the real deal. And it's incredibly fun to watch, even if you don't know that the whole thing was done while the actor was in a condition that would have killed your average person. You see, while filming the first take, something went wrong. Talk went in for a knee, but the stunt performer he was supposed to connect with missed his cue, causing Talk to fall in such a way that a bone in his neck literally broke. And he thought, well, that hurts a lot. And then they went back to one, got the shot on the next try, and sent him to the hospital, where he was informed that had he not been so muscular, he would literally be dead. Something similar happened to Buster Keaton during the filming of Sherlock Jr., but he didn't learn that it had happened until years later. This speaks both to his dedication as a performer and also his incredible ability to perform. But its release came as he was beginning to slow down. In his first decade on the scene, starting with his debut in Ryuhei Kitamura's 2000 film Verses, he appeared in 19 movies. Between 2010 and 2019, it was just seven. And sure, that happens as folks get older. Tak is currently in his mid-40s. But the appearances he's made are as powerful as ever. One of his most frequent collaborators is a man named Yuji Shimomura, who was Yakuza Weapon's action director and had already put Tak in a starring role with his 2005 directorial debut, Death Trance, in which Tak plays the Coffin Man, so named because he was the first person to steal a supposedly witch-granting coffin from the temple that had long protected it. Of course, Everyone wants that power, so reputation or not, they try to take him on, and he must fend himself off from all kinds of bizarre enemies, from men on motorcycles to a dude with a homing rocket launcher to these, like, vampires who kind of act like spiders. I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot going on, often all at once. The point is that Shimomura had set a precedent. In his films, Talk is an invincible murder machine spoken about in hushed tones who seems most comfortable taking on groups whose numbers contain multiple digits. And so it wasn't surprising when 12 years later, Shimomura returned to the director's chair and put the same man in effectively the same part. With 2017's Reborn, Tak is an ex-PMC type who one day becomes the target of his former group and decides to take matters into his own hands. While the actual setting is less inventive than death trances, Shimomura and co. make up for it with far more unique action, like the bit where Tak uses an empty pistol clip to launch a pen into someone's head, or the part where he stabs a guy in the throat with chopsticks before wiping them off and eating the noodles he had been cooking in the microwave before being so rudely interrupted. Also, he literally dodges bullets. Like a bunch of them. But those feel like child's play in the face of what Shimomura undertook with his third feature, which is currently having its premiere at the digital version of the Fantasia Film Festival, and features one of the most fascinating fight sequences in any movie ever, as a single man takes on hundreds of others over the course of an unbroken 75-minute shot. And you'll never guess who that man is. Hello, by the way, and welcome to the Week I Review. You can call me a guy who once hit a moth in mid-flight with a shinai, and today I am talking about Crazy Samurai Musashi. Miyamoto Musashi was a swordsman and philosopher born in the late 16th century, and he's basically the most famous of all of them. There are literally dozens of films that bear his name, as well as appearances in all number of other media. In fact, he is probably the most adapted historical figure of all time. Jesus feels like he might be the exception to that rule, but is he really a historical figure? 
Many of these stories are less based on the realities of Musashi's life than on Eiji Yoshikawa's serialized epic about him that ran in national newspapers from 1935 to 1939. The most famous of these adaptations is Hiroshi Inagaki's Samurai Trilogy, released between 1954 and 1956, starring Toshiro Mifune as the title character. I actually wasn't aware of this trilogy until it was brought up during my second anniversary livestream last week, but I binged them over the weekend alongside the Criterion Channel's commentary from leading historian and translator William Scott Wilson, who is the preeminent scholar on Musashi's life, having written a more accurate biography, as well as putting together seemingly the preferred translation of Musashi's primary text, The Book of Five Rings, which I read, because obviously the most useful skill I can learn in quarantine is how to fight on a 17th century battlefield. It's an awkward book, to be honest, with short chapters that often end with him saying, writing about this is hard, you have to actually do it to understand. And he may have been right, but it doesn't make for compelling reading all these years later. I understand that some folks see it as a Japanese art of war and focus more on the broader philosophical underpinnings of the text, but I'm actually going to come back to a few of the specifics since all that technical advice, which is completely irrelevant in the real world, actually has relevance here in this video. How exciting. <laughs> Despite the names of nearly every work tangentially inspired by him, Musashi was never a proper samurai because he never served under a feudal lord. Instead, he was a wandering ronin, and specifically a shugiyosha who wanders because he wants to better himself and his craft. His only interest was in perfecting his art. And that art was more than just battle. He worked to be an Uruwashi, a full, balanced human, a perfect combination of culture and warrior, and someone who is more interested in enlightenment than battle for its own sake. And it is that development which drives Inagaki's trilogy. In the first film, he is a hothead who fights just because. In the second, he has started down the proper path, though is still a work in progress. A sword polisher turns him away because he wants his sword to be useful for killing and nothing more. By the third, his transformation is largely complete. He is a wizened man who more often diffuses situations than forces them. He understands that not every conflict needs to end in bloodshed, though he does not shy away from it when necessary, and of course stands victorious in all combat situations he's put in. But he's far more interested in the introspection that comes from farming and carving statues than jumping into every duel he sees. The version of the character we see in Crazy Samurai Musashi is the vicious killer of the first samurai film told against the story of the second. It's a depiction of Musashi's battle against the Yoshioka clan, a thing that actually happened and ultimately resulted in its dissolution after he wiped out their leadership. Interestingly, the timeline here more closely tracks to the historical record than Duel at Ishijoji Temples. Initially drafted by Shionsono, this film sees Musashi having already taken down the two heads of the clan, Seijiro and Denshichiro. Now he's coming for a duel with the third, 12-year-old Mata Shichiro. But the Yoshioka clan has an ambush ready. 100 students and 300 mercenaries standing ready to take him down before he can even touch the young leader. But as they jabber on about their plan, he has already laid his trap and gotten by them. And as the boy looks up at the butterfly, he sees Musashi dropping down from the trees, the blade splitting its butterfly on the way into his head. We are seven and a half minutes into the movie, and within a minute, we will be in that shot. In the Book of Five Rings, Miyamoto Musashi says that a man who attains the virtue of the long sword can beat ten men, and thus ten men can beat a hundred, and a thousand can beat ten thousand. In my strategy, he says, one man is the same as ten thousand, so this strategy is the complete warrior's craft. Now it is clear that he is saying that the strategy for a one-man fight is fundamentally the same as a ten thousand-man fight. 
but it could also be read as saying that one man using the strategy could take down 10,000 men. And while Musashi does say it could be used to take down several tens of men and later says 20 to 30 specifically, Sono clearly preferred the latter interpretation. And more power to him, I don't need or want perfect historical accuracy. If Shimomura wants to use the Musashi name purely as a way to justify depicting Tak as yet another invincible murder machine, I'm fundamentally okay with that. It's a shame that they didn't even try to implement Musashi's very specific fighting style, but we'll get there. When I first heard about this movie, it was in the context of that shot, a 77-minute sequence wherein one man takes on hundreds of others. But I didn't know exactly what that meant. 1917 is also purported to be one shot, right? But it's so blatantly, obviously not. And as a closer analog, the villainess is a lot of fun and goes for some sequences that are meant to appear long, but it does such a terrible job of stitching together the various takes that the effect is never actually convincing. Shimomura's earlier films had some solid long takes, so I was hoping for the best. The shot began, and the image quality plummeted, and I knew then that we had switched from the cinema camera to a GoPro or some sort of camcorder, and that this was going to be happening for real. It is a jarring shift, and one that reminded me of my college thesis film, a martial arts psychodrama that was shot using two totally different kinds of cameras, a Canon T2i during the drama to get some of that sweet, sweet depth of field, and then a Sony EX-1 during the fights for the exact opposite reason. I didn't want to worry about focus as the camera moved in and out and around the scene for shots that lasted between 10 and 50 seconds. Plus, the camcorder's ergonomics were much more conducive to that sort of movement. And while the switch from one to the other was extremely noticeable and unfortunate, it was worth the trade-off in context with what I was doing. And clearly, Yuji Shimomura felt similarly. However, I am not totally convinced that it works here. Let me say up front, I think that that shot is a mesmerizing piece of action filmmaking, and I am amazed by what they accomplished here. That said, I need to talk about what doesn't work before I can get to what does. On the one hand, seeing with total clarity everyone on the battlefield really hammers home the scale of what Musashi is up against. All of those bodies in fore and backgrounds shuffling around, swords at the ready, waiting for their chance to take on the man, the myth, the legend. But also think about what I just said. As great as the action sequences in Death Trance and Reborn are, they both definitely suffer from that one-at-a-time mentality of fight choreography. Rather than trying to justify how a fighter could take on a bunch of enemies at once, they are shown to be able to take them down in sequence, because the bad guys are kind enough to take turns. <laughs> It becomes a matter of stamina, a marathon rather than a sprint, as they go for one or two at a time until everyone is down. But usually there aren't that many enemies on screen at a given time, so it's just not as in your face as Crazy Samurai Musashi, which will have dozens. On a perfectly in-focus screen in broad daylight, it is impossible to not be constantly aware of how many people aren't attacking Musashi at every given moment, right? Right from the beginning of the fight, you have dozens of sword-wielding baddies circling him, and he's reliant on the good fortune that no one will attack him from anywhere except the front, and many times he just bonks folks on the head with his sword before they have the chance to do anything. At first, I was a little put off by that, but eventually I realized what this film truly is. Muso the movie. The Muso games, called Warriors over here, are 3D action beat em ups wherein you fight against historically named figures, and there are literally thousands of foot soldiers. But to make that at all possible, these soldiers die as soon as you so much as sneeze in their general direction while posing effectively no threat even if you don't bother. They're content to just hang out, standing at the ready until you swing your weapon, at which point they all just die immediately. Only a fraction will ever get around to actually attacking you, until 
every once in a while, that historical person will show up and actually provide some challenge. And that is literally Crazy Samurai Musashi's structure. And once I came to terms with that, I started having more fun with it. But there's something the game can do that the film can't, but probably wished it could. Disappear the dead bodies. When there is so much going on in an area, it would be genuinely dangerous for the performers to just drop to the ground where they have been bonked or sliced or whatever. Like, it would be super hilarious and epic to see bodies piling up over the course of the fight, but not at the expense of everyone's safety. So the dead have to get off screen somehow. And usually this takes the form of a lengthy stumble towards the edges of the screen. And for some folks, it's a pretty long stumble, which is funny in a less intended way. Had the film used a shallower depth of field, this would still be happening, but it wouldn't be so obvious because the cinematography would draw your eye away from that movement. Accounting for the logistics of the project, this is all understandable and easy enough to give a pass. But there's one aspect that I had a harder time getting over. Why does he only carry one sword? In the Book of Five Rings, there is a chapter titled, There Are Many Enemies, which explicitly deals with how Musashi believed these sorts of fights should be handled. And the first sentence is, draw both sword and companion sword. This dual wielding was a trademark of Musashi's style, and it's historically significant because the battle against the Yoshioka clan was when he first used his second sword as a way to fend off the ambush. But even if I didn't know any of that, the fundamental image of a samurai with two swords at their belt is just so deeply ingrained into all of us that it is genuinely weird to see him without them. Heck, even the 12-year-old boy is wearing them in the final minutes of his life. This Musashi doesn't even have one Saya. Like, there is no place for him to put the sword if he finishes using it. So what does he do? Well, he chucks it. Really, the swords in Crazy Samurai Musashi are like the guns in John Wick. Disposable death tools that get dropped as soon as they stop killing people good. And that's why Musashi has hidden various extra swords around the village where this extended battle takes place, similar to how John Wick planted weapons for different stages of the fight in the catacombs of Chapter 2. When Musashi needs to take a breather, he goes to one of these little alcoves, has some water, and grabs a new blade. And after a minute or two, he jumps back into the fray. But when I say a minute or two, remember that I am talking in real time, which finally brings us to the fun part of the video, where I get to talk about how cool this all is actually, because for all of its faults, Crazy Samurai Musashi is incredibly cool. It's hard to believe that anyone could have successfully pulled this off, right? Even using Muso rules, it requires a single man to engage in some form of physical contact with 400 other people over the course of 75 minutes. And while he can obviously miss a strike here and there and the sound design will save that, he has to actively dodge or block hundreds or thousands of moves, and if he misses one of those and a sword connects with him, that's it. That's the show. Everyone goes back to one, and so all of the pressure is placed squarely on Tok's muscular shoulders. It's good that he has those sword-switching moments to catch his breath, but at each pause point, he knows that the camera is rolling just a few feet away, waiting for him to get a move on. He has to stay in some semblance of character throughout and push past the pain as quickly as possible, lest the pacing be completely destroyed instead of just sort of awkwardly impacted. But that awkward impact ultimately serves a purpose in movies like these. I talked about it during my best of the decade list in relation to Sebastian Schipper's Victoria, a film that definitely has some downtime that any traditional film would be right to remove and rightly criticized for not removing. But in the context of this 130-minute trip through Berlin, there's something very intimate about them. You, you really get a sense of a person when they're just sitting and waiting. And Musashi's breaks do the same thing here. They are the only chance we ever get 
to see inside of his head. I mean, before he shows up to cut down that preteen, all we see of him are a few seconds of flashback where he kills one of the previous Yoshiokas in a duel. Tuck plays the strong silent type in all of Shimamura's films, but the earlier projects were able to rely on other characters having interesting personalities to play off his lack of one. And considering Musashi kills basically every single person who isn't him in this movie, that's just not in the cards here. So we have to connect to Tuck's humanity, which is on full display because even if the character is invincible, he is not probably. The reason that people love long take action scenes like the classic hallway fight in Old Boy is because they really emphasize the effort that goes into a fight. While all stunt performers get worn out from spending hours a day doing a scene over and over again, what ends up on screen often doesn't reflect that. Exhaustion becomes a choice. But when you're working in a single shot, there isn't one. We will see the toll it takes and the stress and exhaustion etched onto Tok's face, especially as we approach the hour mark and beyond, is exactly what I needed to root for him. And the actual Musashi made very clear that he believed you must be proactive in a fight rather than reactive. When against a group, you shift from side to side using both swords to control their movements. He believed that, done right, you could effectively be the commander of your enemies and have total power over them, guaranteeing a victory. He has all kinds of super specific instructions on how to do this, but Crazy Samurai Musashi's epic fight follows none of that. The namesake's clear tactical advice is just straight up ignored, which raises the question of why this is a Musashi story in the first place. But again, I understand. Because what it would take to actually embody all of those principles for 75 minutes straight isn't something I think anybody on Earth could successfully pull off. It would require a fundamentally different type of choreography, and one far more taxing than this. And I don't even understand how you get to this level. Like, seriously, how does a fight like this get choreographed? It seems impossible to me, and yet it happened. Props to action director Isao Karasawa, as well as choreography assistant Shigeki Shiraishi and sword supervisor Yoshitaka Inagawa, who appears in Reborn as Tok's former murder monster bad boy partner. Part of what's so fascinating about Crazy Samurai Musashi's fight scenes is that it often looks like Tok is determining in real time how to act rather than going through predetermined movements. Sure, you can see the choreography here and there, but much of the time it truly feels like he is reacting to the situation, seeing what is coming his way, and then in that split second determining how to handle it. It's kind of amazing. And honestly, I wish I could have been on the set to see it. I wonder if it wasn't a combination of planned choreography and instruction during the shoot. Obviously, much of the audio in the film was added in post, so it seems probable that people whose faces we don't see were talking through the plan live. Like, why wouldn't you say, okay, now bonk the guy on the left, then slash through the one next to him, or even have the guys who are about to strike call out their move beforehand? I really can't fathom any other way to pull this off. But no matter how they did it, the point is that it got done, and it looks good. Like, it's not perfect. This is not the most technical choreography out there, but also, what's there really to compare it to? I've never seen anything like Crazy Samurai Musashi because no one has ever made anything like Crazy Samurai Musashi. And so all we have to do is wonder what's next. I would like people who see this film to be inspired to top it, to embrace its successes and address its failings. But I also understand if they don't, if they simply applaud its existence and let it stand alone as the monolithic achievement in action filmmaking that it is. 8.5 out of 10. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you particularly to my patrons, my mom, Hamry and Marco, Kat Saracata, Benjamin Schiff, Anthony Cole, at Blasian FMA, Magnolia Denton, Elliot Fowler, both of whose names I've been spelling wrong for the past few months, sorry about that, and Greg Lucina. If you like this video, that's great. 
If you didn't, I don't care. If you want to see more, please subscribe. I hope to see you next week.